Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to everyone. Uh, just to let you know that uh, it's uh, three now. Uh, people are still connecting uh, and we are accepting them, of course. Um, this session is being recorded. Uh, so just to let you know that and uh, then I'll uh, pass on the words to um, the speakers. Thank you, Reina. So we'll start the session. Good afternoon. Very welcome to all participants to this first joint webinar with the FE on the topic of pharmacovigilance and the new legislation. Um, I'm really pleased to, to be working for many years already with the FE, particularly with Nancy de Bruyne, who was our loyal partner also within the agency. She has a seat in the management board, is always there to defend our case um, of our small veterinary unit within this big agency that everybody got to know, I think, with, uh, with COVID now. And today, this is our first webinar. We So it's a bit of an experiment for myself as well. And um, we have a lot of participants and few of them, and I think they're right, they're still, they were announced about 600 people. I see 250 now. Some of them are in the beautiful uh, spring sun that is uh, in mainland Europe for the moment. So very welcome. Uh, Myself, I'm a veterinarian by training with uh, some background in, statisti in statistics. I work for the agency since 99 and uh, for the last 10 years, predominantly with a small team in the field of pharmacovigilance. So the main topic today will be to introduce you to, uh, to the topic of pharmacovigilance, particularly from the point of view of the new legislation. And for us also, one of the main reasons is it, it is an opportunity to, to get acquainted again with veterinarians because one, one feeling that I had for many years is that of all our partners, the veterinarians, we, we kind of, I wouldn't use the word neglecting, but we can learn much more of the information that is out there with veterinarians. And similarly, I think also we have a, we, we can do better in exchanging information that we have. So that's that's one of the goals that we have with the new legislation. And that's one of also main object, objectives for today that we uh, will use the opportunity to um, hopefully explain better who we are, how the system is going to work on pharmacovigilance. But at the same time, we hope that we get your questions, remarks, suggestions as a start to learn from each other. And that gives us also the input uh, for the systems that we are making uh, for this new legislation, because theoretically we have now much more databases being becoming available in the beginning of next year that would allow us to have particularly better communicate with veterinarians and exchange of, of information. Um, in terms of some housekeeping rules after the presentation, so you see of the, um, on the short program that we have, I will start introducing a little bit the high level background of the legislation. Um, then we have a point of view from our colleagues uh, in, the, in the profession for Robert Hirsch, Dr. Hirsch. Then Laura, my right hand, will give you more insights on pharmacovigilance reporting and the implementation of UDA vigilance. And at the end, we have quite a long, hopefully, a session of questions and answers with a, with a, a number of panelists that will be introduced uh, later on. So in terms of the questions that you would have, we would ask you to keep those questions, please, till the end. Uh, don't use perhaps the chat. We Our experience with the chat is that often it's very difficult to, to understand uh, exactly the questions from the chat. So it would be nice uh, if you have questions that you raise your hand at the end to we'll explain you how to do this how with, with the system and then you can introduce yourself and, and basically um, have the question and we'll try to answer that with the panelists. Um, if you still have questions or you have other questions that you prefer to do in, in writing, uh, we have um, an email address and, or the general email address from EMA. You can always use that to uh, forward your questions. And it's all, it's all 
also on the program. At, I don't see it on the screen now, but it's a little bit lower below on the program. There is uh, an email address there. So um, now a little word of introduction also from uh, Rens von Donberg, who is the president of the FE. Go ahead, Rens. Thank you, Jos. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon. Uh, also on behalf of FAE, the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe, representing over 300,000 colleagues across 39 countries, I'd like to give you a warm, warm welcome. The overwhelming number of registrations, not participants already, but registrations at least, illustrates quite well the need for a webinar as we have today. Further, I want to say a big thank you to the European Medicine Agency, including FVE in the organization of this event, as well as recognizing the veterinary profession as an important stakeholder going forward the development of the new VMP regulation, including the pharmacovigilance part. As we all know, availability, or more precise, the lack of availability, is a major struggle in veterinary medicine where it comes to VMP. For this reason, it's obvious for all veterinarians in their different disciplines and fields of activities to carefully monitor safety and efficacy of the licensed VMPs available. In their daily job, vets observe at first suspected events following administration of VMPs, and this is the case also with lacking efficacy. And this happens quite regularly. But we all know observing this is not enough. Reporting should follow to collect data centrally and scientifically assess if further action, short or long term, is required. This sounds logic, but reality is much more complex. For lots of practical reasons, the level of correct reporting by far is not high enough. And for this reason, FAE welcomes the new legislation regarding pharmacovigilance reporting, inclusive, inclusively the pharmacovigilance database being part of this. Today, we are here together to learn from each other and to discuss. I hope you will enjoy the speakers and please raise your voice during the panel discussion later on. Wishing you an interesting webinar and switching back to Jos for the first lecture. Thank you very much, Hans. Thank you for this warm welcome also. And I'll be happy to start off with this short presentation to just introduce briefly, give you an insight of the background of the new legislation and um, particularly from the point of view of pharmacovigilance. Please go ahead, Sylvia. Next slide, please. This is the front slide. So the objectives today from our point of view is to to explain you a little bit um, pharmacovigilance in the EU, how this is being organized, how this will be organized in the new regulation um, from the point of view of collecting the, the reports, the single detection, which is the, the new approach instead of the what was called the periodic safety update reports, how we want to uh, improve very much communication as a new element, the other pillar that I will shortly touch on is the pharmacovigilance inspections. So to just give you an idea how this is being done um, and what it means uh, for the companies, maybe briefly something about personal data. And then hopefully later on we learn from you uh, what would be your requirements and expectation in relation to uh, reporting and communication and any other topic. Next slide, please. So technically, we have a few documents when we talk about the regulation. Uh, the regulation itself, 2019-6, we're currently working on what we call the implementing acts. And um, these are a little bit more detailed than the, than the regulation, gives, give more, um, more specifications in particular to the companies. And the, the last bit that we also have started working on are the detailed guidelines and we will have specific modules of these guidelines that are being developed uh, that will outline how pharmacovigilance will be run, what the processes are, and then later at the end of the year, we will be starting with the training in particular for the, for the, for the, for the companies. So from the veterinary point of view, 
um, most of these documents are really orientated to the, the companies, uh, I have to admit. So I'll try to highlight which are the elements that are really of, a, of a relevance to you. But at the same time, I think it's important that you have an idea uh, on how this is uh, operated in the EU. Next slide, please. So for me, the main slide from the veterinary point of view is, is, is the scope slide. Scope is defined in Article 73.2, and it, it uh, lists, and I've just copy-pasted um, the, the elements that are within the scope of pharmacovigilance, so for which we expect veterinarians to be reporting on. First one, A, I'm just going to read it with you, any unfavorable and unintended reaction in any animal to a VMP, lack of efficacy, whether or not in accordance with SPC, there was that there was quite a, a debate in the current legislation sometimes whether uh, use of uh, products outside, out of label can be then, uh, can be then um, recorded as lack of uh, efficacy. So this is really indicating that independent on how you're using in, in line with SPC, lack of efficacy is also reportable. Any environmental incidents, incidents observed, any noxious reactions in humans, and it's not new. Also not new is any residue and product of animal origin exceeding after the set withdrawal period has been respected. We have to admit this is, this is some of these, this is within the scope because there are no other real means for reporting these type of events, but it's very, very ra rare that um, our system is being used to highlight such events. Uh, any suspected transmission of an infectious agent that is a long-standing part of the scope and an, uh, uh, quite recently one now which is highlighted is any unfavorable and unintended reaction in an animal to a medicinal product for human use. So uh, human use for example being uh, products being used under the cascade very well known to, to veterinarians within the EU. So the, the main difference between the current legislation and uh, the new legislation com coming into force in January is actually the, the database. We, for a long time, we have been collecting information already electronically in a database, but we haven't really analyzing them directly in the database. We have started that with parts of the data, but that, this is now being becoming mandatory to um, all the companies will be doing what we call signal detection. So analyzing directly in a central database where we will be collecting all the events from all, from all the reports in the EU, also the serious as well as the non-serious events. So previously the non-serious events were not collected electronically <clears throat> and will be collected now also electronically from, from the events happening in the EU, but also from the events happening uh, for similar and same products uh, outside of the EU. Um, and these are almost half of the reports that we currently have in our database. So just to say that it's an important part of our data set as well. On the right hand side, so the tool that, we, that we're gonna use to be able to query the data from the products uh, product database is called a data warehouse, so this will be the engine for the single detection. The Union product database we, is, is, is the, the main new thing, so for the first time, hopefully, we will have um, a product database in the EU that will have all the VMPs authorized in the EU, and that was the main database that we were really waiting for to go properly analyzing the data uh, at, of our adverse events in our database, because without these product database, product data, we can't really ask the system, give me all the reports for product X, for example. So that's, um, that was the main driver, if you like, of, our, of, of, of the change and in terms of pharmacovigilance. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we, we're just, often we make reference to the pillars um, just to go through them that you have an understanding again from the point of view also from the companies. Um, companies are required to collect and report all events within 30 days. 
including now the non-serious cases electronically. They also need to provide on a yearly basis the sales and the sales will allow us then to calculate the potential exposure um, and the incidence uh, of reporting for certain events, which is important for, uh, for pharmacovigilance. What we expect the companies to do is a continuous adverse event analysis using the systems that you've just seen. Uh, they can do it in their own database, but on a yearly basis, they will have to do go one, one time also uh, in the full data set. Uh, and take advantage of, of all the queries that we have. On a yearly basis for each product in the EU, we expect the companies to have a statement that will confirm their continued benefit risk of the product. And they also have to uh, provide us with their analysis outcomes from that year, um, what type of signals they have found and what is the what are their conclusions, what are their recommendations. So that's the the basic elements of pharmacovigilance. The regulators, the NCAs uh, and the agency all together have an oversight of this exercise. They will do it through specific inspections, uh, pharmacovigilance inspections to see how companies are running that system. And um, the regulators will also do their own analysis, but at a higher level. So where the companies will focus at product level, the regulators will focus at active substance level. So we will query the databases at active substance level and um, monitor continuously if anything pops up, and then we will analyze part of it ourselves and we will liaise directly with the companies to for, for the further analysis and, as analysis and uh, for any um, actions necessary. The, the last bullet point relates to something very specific. It's the master file. It's um, a, a big benefit, I would say, of the new legislation to the companies because the companies can now bring all their processes and procedures together in a big file um, in, uh, within their company. And that file then applies, it collects all the pharmacovigilance aspects for all their products and they can amend that on the go so they don't they don't need to have continuous variations and a lot of expenses like currently is the case. They can just do it in one single file that they that they store. And it is that file also that will be is the focus of the inspections of the of of farm provisions inspections. Next slide. So again to highlight and to emphasize how important uh, veterinarians are. You are really the engines for us. You bring us the data quite clearly. We, def we depend, on, depend on you for the quality of the data. Um, we hope that we can increase. There have been some, some uh, um, efforts done in certain member states, but it's not really happening yet where practice management tools are already linked to facilitate easy reporting. That's for the future, but it's being worked on. And the other element that is coming in now, uh, apart from reporting, are there any other big data that are out there that we can use also for monitoring um, um, how products are behaving on the market? That's the other new element. And of course, for these big data, the veterinarians might also start playing in, in a role. Next slide. I'm going to increase a little bit. So Laura will come back. Um, we have a signal management process that we um, will ask the companies to do. This is just a schematic overview that maybe just highlights that there are a number of phases in there where companies will have to go through a dis detection phase, a validation phase, and then they will come up with proposals for action. Next slide. And an important way for us to prioritize the work, because if you run the data, if you run what we call a single detection query on the system, you have potentially a lot of um, potential signals popping up and that we you need to prioritize. You can't really focus on everything at once. And for this, we have developed a medically important events list. We will also um, require the companies to focus on. So for each of the different species, we have highlighted the number of 
limited number of events that we will that we think are critical and that that we will ask the companies always to focus on whenever they have a report coming in we expect them to um, at the end of the year to have some feedback of their analysis of these type of reports next slide just to say that our database is very skewed, um, meaning that we have a lot of reports uh, for antiparasitics. We have quite a number of reports for vaccines, immunologicals, for non-steroidals. And I think it's kind of mirroring probably also a little bit the market. It not does not necessarily uh, say something about um, safety issues per se, but it's just to say that this is just what we have in our database. Next slide. Similarly, next slide, please. Similarly, in terms of um, the species distribution, the next slide, please. We also have the, predominantly we have um, events um, and, and uh, reports related to dogs, small animals, cats, and uh, much, much less on food producing animals. And the next slide, please. And that's another reason, and I'm very pleased about that. We have an Article seven, uh, 79 in the legislation, which specifically foresees now that we as agency can go into targeted meetings with uh, specialized veterinary practices. We had two uh, a couple of years ago, and we intend to start uh, soon, and particularly to, to target um, Veterinarians specialized in food producing animals. We know that they have built up and they have specialized a lot over the years and they have their own know-how and we hope that we can exchange that know-how. We see that this is not really coming through the, the normal reporting route. And so through these meetings, we hope we can, we can improve on that. Next slide. Last, that's my last slide. Pharmacovigilance as such has not changed. Uh, it's, it comes back always to the, the analysis when you analysis the data is always a veterinarian who looks at the narrative and then makes a judgment, uh, a kind of clinical judgment based of, of what the reading is. And it's often, it can be easy when you talk about injection site reactions, anaphylactic type reactions when they're happening very close to the, the time of exposure of the, of the event, then you can quite easily conclude on something. But often this is not the case. Often when you, when you deal with rare events, long-term effects, confounding factors, concomitant products being used, underlying disease, possible interaction, then it becomes much, much more difficult to come to a conclusion, which you also see, and it's in the news in terms of COVID vaccines. So that's nothing new to the veterinarians out there. I think you, we, I hope from personally that you, you see the relevance of lack of efficacy also. Human reactions will always remain a focus from the regulatory point of view. Um, abortion, mutagenicity, embryo toxicity type of reactions are very important for the follow-up of products in the market. And then we, we don't forget that at the end of the day, there they are still observational data. And that's another of our uh, focus perhaps in the future. If we identify issues that we will learn, we need to learn more of, we will hopefully start more prospective type of posterization studies where we in a ram randomized way that's the ideal situation can see if uh, certain rare events are really uh, related to the use or the exposure of certain uh, products so by this I, I hope i've given you a little bit longer than anticipated but a, a very short overview of um, of what the New legislation is is bringing us and my colleague Laura in um, will give you much more detail. But I'm first handing now the floor to our colleague Robert Hutch, Dr. Hutch, and Dr. Hutch is a veterinarian who was um, graduated in Leipzig in February 2013 scientific assistant in toxicology since March 2013, speci speciality in pharmacology and toxicology, member of the 
FE EVA Medicines Working Group since 2017 and the chair of that since 2019 and an observer for the FVE Medicines Working Group since 2020. Very welcome, Dr. Hirsch. And um, your title is Input from the Veterinary Profession. Thank you. Um, dear Jos, uh, thank you very much uh, for the very nice introduction. And um, thank you, dear colleagues, uh, for the opportunity to uh, present um, the topic today from uh, the veterinary profession's uh, viewpoint. First of all, if we have a look at the new uh, re regulation 2019-6, um, we should uh, read um, the recitals as they give us uh, some information about um, the background and the ideas uh, behind the new le legislation. And uh, two recitals were of interest for me, um, for example, um, recital number 55, which states that pharmacovigilance rules are necessary for the protection of public and animal health and of the environment. Collection of information on suspected adverse events should contribute to the good usage of veterinary medicinal products. I think that this is um, a very good um, cause and one that we can all agree on. Number 58 uh, states that in the light of experience, it has become clear that, that it is necessary to take measures to improve the operation of the pharmacovigilance system. And I'm very happy um, that uh, Jos uh, mentioned this in uh, his introductory uh, words, that he said that from his point of view, um, the vets have been a little bit neglected in the past and um, that we should uh, improve the exchange of information between the vets and um, the agency and um, the competent authorities. So this is something that I very much agree on. And this, uh, this is also the main focus um, of my presentation today, because I would like to um, talk about the problems uh, that we uh, as veterinarians currently see in, in the system. And I would also like to make um, suggestions about further improvements. If we look um, at the regulation in more detail in chapter four and section five, this is uh, the section about pharmacovigilance. And we have um, a number of articles uh, from article 73 to article 81, if you uh, want to look it up yourself, which talk about um, the new system. And uh, quite a lot of stakeholders are addressed in these uh, articles, for example, the marketing authorization holders, um, the agency, the member states, commission, and the general public. But that's also addressed which is um, obviously very good and necessary. And um, a specific um, addressing of the VETS happens in uh, Article 79.2. Um, in two um, yeah, sentences, first of all, uh, competent authorities may impose specific requirements on veterinarians and other healthcare professionals in respect of the reporting of um, suspected uh, adverse events. And the second sentence says that agency uh, or the agency may organize meetings or a network for groups of veterinarians or other healthcare professionals where there is a specific need for collecting, collating, or analyzing specific pharmacovigilance data, something um, that Jos has already uh, mentioned. And I think that especially um, these new options um, or new opportunities for meetings uh, and networks is one that will greatly improve um, the pharmacovigilance system in the future. Um, the signal detection is, as it has already been mentioned, uh, the cornerstone of the future pharmacovigilance system. And if you think about um, a system that depends on signal detection, then one has to conclude that any system uh, like this can only work properly if the sensors, which are in this case the veterinarians, are really well integrated into the system. And um, let's have a look at the current situation in adverse event reporting. About 98% um, of all reports on adverse events are currently reported either by vets directly to the competent authorities or uh, via the marketing authorization holders. Other stakeholders like animal owners or pharmacists report less than 2% of all cases. So it's obvious that the vets are the most important um, yeah, input uh, givers in this um, context. Therefore, I think um, that the improvement um, of the quality of the system and any improvement of the data that we can collect in the system needs to focus um, first and foremost on the veterinarian. Um, as it has already been um, mentioned, we have underreporting of adverse events. Uh, and I would like to highlight some um, major issues uh, that contribute uh, to this. First of all, almost all practitioners 
um, have experienced side effects uh, in their own practice, which is to be expected. But only about 40% of all vets have made a report about this in the past year or ever. So this also means that one in two vets has not reported an adverse event in the past year or ever. Uh, we also see large differences in reporting between um, different member states. We have some member states um, where the reporting uh, morale, as to say, is quite high, with about 60% of vets um, that made a report in the past year, whereas we also have uh, member states where only 10% of the vets made a report in the past year, so we can see huge differences within the EU. Um, as uh, Jos has already mentioned, we also have large differences uh, in reporting in the species. Here's an example from Germany from 2019, where we had uh, almost 1,000 cases um, reported in dogs, but only 10 cases in pigs and only just eight cases in poultry, even though the uh, population of pigs and poultry in Germany is also very large. And um, yes, this is also supported by the data report, uh, reported by EMA. We also have um, yeah, differences and yeah, problems with uh, reporting um, if we look at the type of the adverse event. For example, the lack of efficacy is um, sometimes or by some vets not uh, regarded as a true adverse event because um, maybe some colleagues see it as really a very narrow definition. And we also might have a problem with the underreporting um, of uh, drugs that are used off label. Uh, which are often not reported, and um, especially yeah, difficult um, is uh, suspected adverse events where the causality is not uh, obvious, and these issues are also sometimes underreported. So, um, what can we do to improve the situation? My suggestion would be to um, ask the vests uh, first two questions. Um, first, what stops you from uh, reporting adverse events? And second, what would increase your willingness to report adverse events? Um, and a good place to start is uh, a very nice uh, paper um, by Nancy uh, De Bruyne et al. from 2017 uh, in the Veterinary Record Open, which I uh, would like to recommend uh, to all stakeholders in this uh, regard. So what stops uh, vets uh, from reporting? First of all, reporting is time consuming. About 50% of the reports take more than 30 minutes, and about 24% of reports take more than one hour. And one has to remember that the vets uh, do not receive any remuneration uh, for this effort. So what could be done about this? My suggestion would be that we should try to reduce the time needed for reporting um, as much as possible. Um, one could, for example, make reporting as easy as possible by allowing user accounts on the websites of the competent authorities, which would um, reduce uh, the need to enter your personal data every time you make a report. Currently, we don't, for example, have this option uh, in Germany. So you would really have to enter your address, your name every time again. A second point is uh, one should make websites nice, intuitive and quick. Uh, we all are used um, to uh, very polished uh, and very um, uh, yeah, usable uh, websites when, when we use the web privately or, or professionally. But uh, just to give you one example, if you would like uh, to enter information about an adverse event uh, on the German uh, competent authorities website, which has already um, been um, yeah, made, made better in the, in the past years, uh, it takes you about tw 25 seconds before you can enter the first letter if you after you open the website. So in my view, this is um, way too long. Um, users is expect quick websites where you click on the link and the next uh, site opens and you don't have to wait for quite a long time. Another idea would be um, to have a working mobile version of uh, these reporting websites or if um, preferred by vets, uh, an app. And I think that this could um, yeah, support reporting in the field, especially uh, when treating farm animals and where you are not in your office. And I think it's also important to offer support on the uh, website so uh, that if you run into any problem or have questions and don't understand, for example, what should be um, entered into a specific uh, data field, 
then it would be very nice to have a number which you could call or to have, a, for example, a chat uh, function, functionality where you can get uh, quick help. Another idea, and this has already been uh, mentioned by Jos, uh, would be to um, create uh, application programming interfaces, which are basically tools that would allow the, um, the producers of the software uh, manufacturer, uh, of the practice management software companies, um, to implement reporting functions into these uh, practice management software. And I think that this would have a, a huge benefit. For example, we, you could have uh, automatic completion of the data about the reporter. You could have um, automatic completion of the data about the animal uh, where you want to report an adverse event. Um, you could also um, include data about the drugs uh, that are used if you have already um, documented them in your practice management software and also data about pre-existing conditions or lab uh, laboratory analysis um, could be um, yeah, uploaded into the system without additional workload to the veterinarian. Uh, so I think that uh, this would be a very good way um, to have uh, easier, faster and more accurate ways of reporting. And given that um, these uh, functionalities uh, would have to be, um, of course, um, created by uh, the companies that, uh, that sell this practice management software, I think it would be nice to have a pilot project, for example, for these APIs, um, so that it would be easier for them to actually integrate uh, these um, yes, reporting standards into the software. Uh, to give you an, an actual example, I, I made some uh, screenshots from our uh, German uh, official adverse event reporting website, uh, which is fortunately also available in English. And if you start um, with the report, you would have to enter the data of the sender. And all the data that is required here could be autofilled um, from your existing practice uh, management software. Data about the animal, which uh, is the, the second um, page you would have to enter uh, could also be uh, autofilled from uh, your software and only maybe some um, explanations about the reason for treatment would have to be uh, filled in manually. Data about the drugs used could also uh, be um, used uh, from the system that you already have or you could have a cross link to the union product database so that you wouldn't would not uh, have to go to the um, to the problem of finding out, the, for example, the MA number or yeah, other information that you don't have uh, at hand when you sit in front of your computer and want to enter the information. <clears throat> so um, if uh, one could implement uh, this uh, as suggested, I think that about two thirds of all the data fields could be auto-completed from the practice management software. And this uh, would um, help the vet to focus on the actual description of the event and the time uh, needed for the report would be reduced significant, uh, significantly and I think that also the quality of the report could be improved. Uh, what are other things uh, that stop vets uh, from um, yeah, reporting adverse events? Some uh, vets, or not, not only some, but about 75% of vets uh, of percent of vets are unhappy about the feedback that they received after making a report. For example, 50% of vets in the EU never received any feedback after making a report. And I believe that this is something that could be uh, quite um, yeah, dismotivating. What could be done about this? I think that we should improve uh, the quality of the feedback. For example, one should give immediate uh, feedback when the report uh, or that the report was received and that it will be uh, reviewed. Then one should thank the vets for their efforts to make this feedback and to make the, the um, report. And it is very important to inform the vets about the outcome uh, of the assessment of the report. Because if a vet um, sees that the report actually made an impact, for example, on the SBC uh, or other issues, this will be highly motivational for him or her to um, keep on reporting and to really try to help uh, all of us uh, to increase the safety of, of veterinary medicines. And I think that the summary publications that are already available, for example, the annual pharmacovigilance uh, bulletin are a good start, but they can only be an add-on for the individual feedback that should be given to each vet uh, that made a report. 
Um, as uh, some of you knows that uh, since 2019, uh, IMA um, offers uh, this uh, website that you can find uh, under the um, URL given uh, on the top of the slide about um, information received uh, on uh, suspected adverse events in uh, yeah, veterinary medicines. And I think that this website is a good start, but uh, it could become uh, more useful for the practitioner. And uh, in order to uh, achieve this, one should ask uh, the question, what uh, do vets expect from such a database? And I think that if uh, one uh, starts to look at this uh, website and uh, starts to improve this website with this uh, question in mind, then I think the data, um, yeah, the data um, available in this database could be really helpful uh, to inform vets about um, known facts about uh, adverse events of uh, uh, drugs. And then another uh, suggestion um, from my side for the for the website uh, of EMA, why not make a section for the healthcare professional specifically, so that a vet could um, more easily find the information that is needed for him, uh, because um, finding these uh, or this uh, website that, that is displayed in this slide is uh, actually not that easy if you start from the EMA website. Um, another problem is that about 60% uh, of vets do not report a possible adverse events because uh, they are unsure if the event was actually caused by a drug. And I think um, that the only thing that could be done about this is to improve um, the education about um, adverse events. And this uh, should be done on um, multiple, um, yeah, multiple um, points uh, during um, the education of vets. For example, uh, in postgraduate education, like the, the European colleges, or if we look uh, at the German uh, situation in, in the Fachwehr Arts, why not make uh, one adverse event report, for example, mandatory, so that every vet uh, that uh, does this uh, postgraduate education has uh, already reported at least one adverse event. And the topic could, could and should also be included uh, into uh, the, the curriculum uh, for the students. And I think that the workshops like the one that we uh, do today uh, and other uh, workshops and courses um, could be very helpful for the continued education. And I think uh, uh, if you really want to motivate uh, even more vets to participate in this, then it would all, uh, always be nice to offer uh, continued education points, which as we all know are a kind of special currency for veterinarians. Uh, coming to the conclusions, um, I think that uh, the, it's very good um, that the shortcomings of the current system are recognized by the new uh, legislation. And uh, I think that we all can agree uh, on the point that vets are the key players needed to improve the pharmacovigilance system. And in my opinion, the efforts um, for the improvement should focus on making reporting easier and quicker, that we should improve the communication um, with the vets, and that we should uh, always work on the education of vets. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Hatch. Very nice uh, presentation from your site and already very good um, proposals and, and subjects for our discuss discussion later on on how to improve, in particular, giving the feedback. That's the one thing that we definitely want to work on. And that's also one of the one of the topics that uh, Laura will now present on. Laura Descalso is my right-hand colleague working for many years uh, within the veterinary unit on the topic of pharmacovigilance. She is the specialist in everything on the, the database sites and the data themselves. And uh, she is also the person that will bring forward the specifications coming out of this meeting uh, for the new system, Laura, we, we, we have a lot of expectations on you. <laughs> so okay. please go ahead. Okay, as just mentioned, um, I'm going to focus more on the um, uh, data collection system, data analysis system, and pub data publication system that we are, we either currently have or we are going to build on the EVVET 3 project for the new legislation. So, on the first part, uh, I will show how the reports are flowing and being collected now and then in the future from January 22. 
Then briefly show what the EVVET database will look like, the components that it will have. And then we will look at various aspects of the data. So how the data is collection, we look at the reporting form. Uh, then we will look also at the data analysis tools and the methodology that will be used to assess this data, this adverse event data that we are collecting. And then uh, we'll take a look as well at the publication of the data that we are collecting, what uh, we have now, and then we will go in for the future. So first, I will start uh, describing how the reports are being collected at the moment. So for ad adverse event reports that occur in the EEA, there are really two options. The veterinarian or the animal owner can report to the marketing authorization holder, and then the marketing authorization holder will send the report to the competent authority of the country reaction occur. And then the competent authority will then send the report to the UDRA vigilance database. Then there is another option where the uh, veterinarian or member of the public can report to the national competent authority directly and is then the national competent authority that will send the report to the central database and also inform the marketing authorization holder or holders of the products involved in the report. With regards to non-EEA reports, those reports, the marketing authorization holder is sending directly to the central database at the moment. So this is the current, uh, over, current system. With regards to the legislation from January 22, uh, what is, will be happening is that the Fed can report still to either the competent authority or the marketing authorization holder, but then all the reports will be sent directly to the central database. So for EEA reports and on EEA reports will be all available in the central database. Then we move on to the components of the new UDRA vigilance system that we are building. As you can see, it's a fairly complex system and it's got various aspects. So we've got the users, which will be national competent authorities, marketing authorization holders, and then the members of the public and the veterinarians. Although the veterinarians and the public will not be registered users in the system, but will be accessing the data that we publish. So we've got uh, the reporters, which will be the direct reporters to the system, which will be the national competent authorities and marketing authorization holder users need to register to be able to report to EVVET. We've got a database that deals with the data collection. So it's where we receive all the adverse event reports reported for from national competent authorities and marketing authorization holders. And then all this data is transferred to what we call the data warehouse, which is the system that will be used to assess the data that is collected in the database. And we will use this system as well to publish the data. We are already publishing some data as the previous speaker has shown and is uh, done via this data warehouse. We will also uh, define the business processes to move this information along. So one of them will be uh, regarding the signal detection and management, which I will describe briefly later. And then uh, we will also, as, as I believe Josh mentioned before, we'll have a system to share the outcomes of, from the inspections. And then I'll move along to the data collection. So this is what the new form that we are developing uh, for uh, the new legislation will look like. 
the, for the data collection. So the first part will be administrative data. So where has the reaction occurred? Who is the sender on the, of the reaction and so on. Then the next part will be related to the animal data. So how many animals were treated, how many reacted, the species and the grade, weight, age and so on. Then the next part of the report uh, will collect the data related to the products or products administered to the animals uh, and uh, various types of information are collected as much as possible really to be able to then assess the data. So the name of the product, active ingredient and the lot number if available, who administered the product, whether it was at used according to label or not, and then some information related to whether there was previous exposure or previous reactions to the product and whether the product had been stopped and reintroduced. And then the next aspect of the data collection is related to the adverse events. So there is one section dedicated to the case narrative where the full information about the report can be entered in text format. And then all the adverse events that have been mentioned in the case narrative will be coded using what we call the VEDRA terminology. So then this coding allows you to group all these adverse event information for subsequent analysis. So this is very a very important aspect of the data collection. Then there is also additional information related to whether the product was used on label or not. And if it was used off label, you can enter what type of off label it was. And then from the data collection, we can move on to the data analysis part. So this slide here shows the, it's just a brief introduction to the type of methodology that uh, will be used for analyzing, assessing that data and uh, then coming to a conclusion. So where do you start assessing this data? So the assessor should be really familiar with the product that is assessing. So at the minimum, you should study the summary of product characteristics and familiarize themselves with the type of product it is, what active ingredients it contains, the mode of action and the indication, and also the adverse events that are uh, mentioned already in the product information. And then we can move on to the screening procedure. I will show more details on the slide uh, coming here. So the first thing that you should really do is get an overview of the data that you have for the product. So how many reports, the data distribution, so what kind of species are involved, the geographical origin, so whether there is clusters of reports, so they are widely spread. And then, as just mentioned before, it's also a matter of resources. So you have to, sometimes for some products, you have a lot of reports and you need to focus on specific uh, adverse events. And uh, one tool that may help is look at what is already on the SPC and focus on adverse events that are not yet mentioned on the product information and prioritize them based on the number of reports and the kind of adverse event reports that you may see on the data. So you will then screen the data for any urgent issues and one of the tools that will be used in the future that just mentioned earlier will be the important medical events. You can also look at human reports uh, firstly. And then when it comes to the assessment, 
uh, then you look at the possible association of the product at the report level for each of the events or signals that you are investigating. And if you have a lot of reports, there are various aspects of the data you may wish to see whether they have an impact. Like, for example, you may want to focus on whether the breed is an issue, uh, the age of the animal, whether it affects younger or older animals, what other reactions uh, may be reported in the same report, time to onset, uh, the details about the dose and the route of administration, and whether it was used on label or not. Uh, and then while assessing the information, obviously there are some caveats and issues that you need to look at uh, because sometimes uh, the, the adverse event may have been due to the disease and not to the actual product, or there may be some other product that has been administered to the animal that was what caused the reaction. So those aspects need to be considered. And then on the next slides, I will show you the system that we, we have already some of these reports in the current system, but I will show you the ones that we are developing for the new signal management process and how they work in general. So this one, for example, that I'm showing here is the one that will be mainly used for signal detection. And they all work more or less the same way. So you select an active substance or a product or a group of products, a period of time, and you can use additional filters if you wish, such as species, breed, age, region, and so on. And then the system first will return, as I mentioned before, an overview of the data for the product that you selected. And here, for example, you can see the regional distribution, and you also get a table that will show you the data of that product per country. So the number of reports per country, for example. And from the results here, you can click on the number and it will take you to a line listing showing you further information and eventually to the case reports. So you can view each individual report. And then we move on to more of the signal aspect of the system. So in this report, uh, what we have here is breaking down the data for the product that you selected and is showing you all the adverse event reports that were all the clinical signs that were reported on that uh, period of time that you selected. So, for example, you've got the number of cases uh, that you received during that time showing, let's say, hyperactivity between this period of time and then uh, on these columns, we have some statistical indicators which uh, help um, highlight potential signals or issues. So it's a, it's a measure of what we call disproportionality, which indicates that a particular reaction may be reported more often for a product than for all the other products that we have in the database. So that can be used as a, say, as a tool to highlight certain issues. But of course, as just mentioned earlier, you always have to apply clinical judgment when assessing the data, because a statistical signal may or may not, will, a statistical signal does not denote a causal association between the product and the reaction. Sometimes it may be enough uh, to use the previous uh, report. If you only have a handful of reports, it may be enough to just look at the previous report that I showed to uh, assess all the data and allow you to come to a conclusion. But for some products, you may have a really large number of reports and you may wish to look at specific aspects of the data. So we have tools that allow you to do so, so you can uh, 
break down the data based, let's say, on the time to onset and focus on the ones that are close uh, uh, related to the time uh, that the medicine was administered to the animal. You can look at off-label, you can look at specific species and so on. And it also allows you to break down the data for the product uh, by age, by weight, and by breed to assess the specific uh, aspects of the data and help you to come to a conclusion. So you can also look at a lack of efficacy or safety issues separately if you wish. And also for products that have different pharmaceutical forms, you can break down the data between the different forms to see if, whether it, uh, the issue that you are assessing affects one of the uh, pharmaceutical forms or is common to both, for example. So that was the part related to data analysis. So once the assessor has uh, evaluated the data, the actual outcome of the evaluation is collected into a database and then circulated to uh, the different uh, committees. The issue is discussed and then there is normally a conclusion made which falls roughly into four different uh, types of conclusion. The first one could be that there is no causal association between the reaction and the product. So nothing further should be done. The next uh, conclusion could be that uh, you're not sure. You have not you have not yet got sufficient data to conclude whether the, there is a causal relationship between the product and the reaction. So the decision is to keep monitoring the reaction and gather further data to see whether the next time you assess the signal, you will have sufficient data to come to a conclusion. Another possible outcome could be that uh, the marketing authorization holder may be asked to perform a study uh, to gather further data and to allow, which may allow to come to a conclusion. And then uh, the fourth aspect will be that there is sufficient data to prove the course of relationship and a change to the product information is recommended. And then we come to the publication of the data. As it has been mentioned by the previous speakers, we are now publishing some data uh, related to pharmacovigilance, which is difficult to find, but uh, some of it is published on the, uh, on the EMA website. And it's published under the veterinary regulatory page, pharmacovigilance, and there you will find the annual bulletin and you will also now find the recommendations made for changes of product information made uh, for centrally authorized products. So the annual bulletin uh, is published here and the all the changes that have been recommended for product information for centrally authorized products can be found following this link. So this is the type of information that we publish on the annual bulletin. Uh, so it, it, we give an overview of the data that has been collected in utero vigilance during that period of time. And then we also now publish information on the issues that we are monitoring for each product. And this is what the recommendations for changes to DSPC look like. So the wording that is being added or changed is highlighted on the publication. 
The previous speaker also mentioned the ADR website. We are currently publishing information on adverse event uh, reports received for centrally authorized products. And uh, you can access this database via the direct link, uh, which is mentioned here, or also via the, Udravit, uh, by the EMA website on the UDRA Vigilance section, there is a link to this database as well. But as it was mentioned earlier, it's perhaps not very easy to find. Um, we need to find a better way of uh, publishing this information. And this is the type of data that we are currently publishing. So on the first pages, uh, we publish a summary of the information for each product. So the number of cases, the number of animals affected. Then there is also a graph that shows the distribution of the adverse events uh, for the product. The, a breakdown of the cases over the years and the distribution by region, so EEA, non-EEA. Then uh, on the next uh, tabs, there is information also on the number of base cases per species and per breed. And then uh, it shows um, the distribution of the data by uh, the different types of uh, adverse event report groupings. And you can select a species and focus the information on the specific species that you selected. And you can focus on specific terms as well, specific adverse events and get the numbers of reports for that particular reaction. And then finally, on the last tab, you can access what we call a line listing showing uh, information for each adverse event report that had been received for the product in the Yodra Vigilance database. So it shows you an overview of the information of the adverse event report and a link that will take you to the actual case report and show you the information on that individual report. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Ben. Well, thank you very much, Laura. Yeah, go ahead, Trent. Thank you, thank you, Jos. Um, dear colleagues, uh, after these interesting lectures, I think it's uh, it's time to uh, to switch to our uh, to our panel. Um, and to win a little bit of speed, uh, Jos, uh, Laura and Robert, uh, you already met. So I'd like to give the floor to the other four colleagues and ask them to introduce themselves and to tell a little bit, one, two phrases uh, about their expectations of the new medicines legislation, uh, uh, specifically, of course, the pharmacovigilance part and uh, a short statement. That's, that's already enough. Uh, can I give the floor first to Anita? Yeah, thank you very much, Benz, Joss. Um, my name is Anita Botger. I am a vet. I started to work at a Dutch agency uh, uh, at, uh, in 2011, first as clinical assessor, and since 2017 as a coordinator for pharmacovigilance and veterinary affairs. My expectations of the new regulations are that there will be more transparency for pharmacovigilance, which was also a point raised by the FEE and improved databases, also product union product database, and improvement of the cascade, that's something else, and antimicrobial resistance as spearhead of the uh, new regulation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita. And you, you forgot to tell we graduated together in the same class. You're right. Thank you. Toril. Uh, thank you, Rens. Um, my name is uh, Turil Moseng. Uh, I am uh, Norwegian, living in Oslo, uh, vice president uh, for the FVE, and I've been a delegate in uh, FVE and UVP since 2007. I'm a veterinarian and a small animal practice for the last uh, 25 years. 
Uh, my expectation for this is that we can give uh, drugs in a secure way to animals um, in the best way and therefore have uh, an information um, vice versa uh, to the best for the security and also uh, the animal resistance. And uh, the last but not least, it must be easy for the vets to report in a busy day. Thank you. And a busy day, yeah. and it's always a busy day. Thank you very much, Toril. Uh, Piotr, can I give you the floor? Thank you. Thank you, Rens. Thank you, Joss. Uh, my name is Piotr Kwiecinski. I'm a veterinary practitioner. I am UEVP uh, president. And uh, my expectations, I can say, I would say are. Uh, as uh, I have seen on those uh, excellent presentations, especially by Dr. Robert Hertz, uh, I know that um, we have much more uh, reports from companion animals, but we have almost nothing from food producing animals. My clinic is, uh, work, works with uh, mostly food producing animals, so which means that we have to find some kind of simplif simplification to, to make a report in the field, for veterinarians in the field. I guess a program for companion animal in the clinic should be different than that of the vet working on multiple farms, working on the, uh, on the field. So which means that maybe veterinary medicines are better made for food producing animals rather than for companion animals, but this is not the point, of course. But you know, come to conclusion, very short. So we need more simplified, less time consuming, very easy to complete, and also not no feedback is demotivating, dismotivating. Thank you very much. Thank you. And part of your statement is triggering, as, as we know you. And for those colleagues who are not aware, UEVP, where Piotr is president, is the uh, is a section for the veterinary practitioners of, of Europe. Ramiro, can you please take the floor? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Congratulations to the colleagues that have present several issues. I, my, I, I am veterinarian. I worked in veterinary medicinal products since 1991. I expect for the new legislation to increase confidence, to increase transparency, to improve the quality and the number of reports we receive every year in order to be in a better position to reach agreement, to reach conclusions on the different aspects of safety and efficacy of the product that Nowadays, we have several doubts and we are not able to reach to a conclusion. Thank you. Okay, okay, Ramiro, thank you for, for that statement. So we have seven veterinarians here, Anita, Toril, Piotr, Ramiro, Jos, Robert and Laura. So I think we can answer all your questions and remarks. So I hand over to the audience who wants to raise a yellow hand uh, and take the floor uh, for a question. Perhaps we just have to explain, Rens, that uh, <clears throat> on your screen you see this little head there. If you click on it, that allows you then to raise your hand at the top of this small uh, window that will pop up. So first, hit this uh, image of a of an of a visage of a, of a person. Thank you. An icon. An icon. Yeah. I don't see so far. Maybe the colleagues have to think a little bit. I, so, I can see off. Margarida is as to Dante. As to Dante, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I am. Uh, I am. I am a policeman uh, from in Portugal, <laughs> and uh, I'm a pharmacist, and I work in pharmacovigilance for um, human medicines. Uh, but I am interested, uh, of course, in um, pharmacovigilance for veterinary me medicines. And what I would like to know, because we have some, uh, I work in a consultancy company, and we have some clients who have human medicines and also veterinarian medicines. 
uh, I understand and uh, uh, it makes uh, all the sense that um, the causality assessment and the signal detection uh, will have um, uh, the input from the veterinarians. My question is that if in the legislation, um, is there the figure of a responsible for pharmacovigilance? And if it's in the EU legislation, if it says that it, need, it needs to be a veterinarian, or if there is some, some uh, room for a pharmacist to, to help in the system. From the, from the company's point of view, from the marketing authorization holder's point of view. Okay, Margarita, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I think can I, more question for yeah, regulator, Jos. Yes, just, just to highlight. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Antidiante, for that question. We had similar questions coming to us more from the point of view, like you just have explained from the company's point of view. Um, so we we actually invite you to send these questions uh, directly to the email address that is included here. We want to really focus this this meeting on questions uh, on the topic of communication of pharmacovigilance to veterinarians directly. So any questions related okay. to, to companies, uh, if you don't mind, to we we'll very happy okay. to help you. But uh, one to one then. Thank you. Okay. Thank you thank very much. You. Thank you, Jos. Other hands raised. And Jos, maybe you can look with me because I can't see them. I here. can see Declan O'Rourke is one of our well-known colleagues that we have been okay. working for. Declan, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, pardon. Everyone. Yeah. We don't hear you yet, Declan. Ah, sorry, Jos, I had to unmute. Apologies. Um, yeah, this is to, to the Sorry, um, Declan Rock, a veterinarian. Um, Dr. Hirsch re referenced the F uh, EMA FEV survey, Joss, and referred to the different reasons why we don't get reports. And one of them was that vets are unsure of this. But um, one of my concerns is that, that it's sort of the numbers game, that, that whilst we can put all this um, sort of new uh, IT in place, uh, there's a lot of vets to get out to there to ensure that they understand what adverse events are and, and how to report. So how do we get that true? Because to give you an example, at the same time as that survey was done, we looked in the UK as to, you know, what was the average number of reports? And we found that the average number of reports in the total that were submitted to the authority was one per practice. And we have an average of about six to eight practitioners per practice. So it sort of puts the numbers game in perspective. And given the FE president said they've got so many members, I'm just wondering, is there other ways of communicating this out or trying to, you know, stimulate reporting, Joss? Um, okay, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lecton. You, you've addressed it to me, but I'll, I'll be happy also if my colleagues, member states, uh, colleagues will, will have their insight in this. Um, I think you raised an important point that we, we you know, the reality is that we're reaching only a minority of veterinarians for the moment. One way we're thinking of doing this, if we find a way directly from our systems to publish the data easier and to reference them, for example, in the veterinary record with a, a small uh, monthly um, summary of the latest uh, outcomes of our signal detection that then reference you directly back to a web page where you can find that information um, directly available. So th this is an... This is one way forward that we have been thinking of exposing our to the veterinary uh, community. We, you know, there are some um, there are some journals that are widely being used. So, but I'm interested to learn also from from other speakers and and from panelists. Thank you. One of the other panelists wants to add. Uh, yes, perhaps uh, what I do in the Netherlands is I give presentations to special special groups of, for instance, poultry vets, and uh, with, together with the veterinary association, and also give uh, college to the students at the veterinary university. So 
this is the way how I try to encourage reporting and explaining the pharmacovigilance systems. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anita. I now can see the raising hands. It's on my screen. Uh, Ramiro, you wanted to add? Yes, uh, I would like to also say that uh, in collaboration with the Royal College of Veterinarians in Spain, we have developed an uh, electronic system for simplifying the notification and is directly related to the electronic prescription. So the veterinarian that usually make the prescription electronically will have another module to try to help them to notify simply to us the advent events. So we hope that this in future will help to increase the number of cases we receive because we know that there is a clear under reporting in Spain. Having in mind that we have uh, increased the number in the last years, but I think we have to to try to continue uh, the uh, information and the uh, trying to convince veterinarians to to notify all the suspicion of their events. Thank you. Thank you, Ramiro. Next next uh, person, a uh, colleague asking a question is Mrs. Barbara Cuniberti. I hope I pronounce well. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Barbara. I'm a small animal vet based in UK. And I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I've seen from Laura's presentation, she presented some data where there are European and non-European countries. So I would like to know uh, how UK is now um, based on this system, because I'm not sure, I'm watching, look at the government website, I'm not sure how we are going with the Brexit to report adverse event now that we are outside the UK, outside the EU. And also if the system for non-European countries to report the, these adverse events are similar, so we can compare the data actually between European and non-European countries. Uh, and then the second question is about the uh, user website on the EVA website. I look at the website sometimes and I'm not sure if the data that are reported there are on the all the adverse events that are reporting from the vets or are only the adverse events that are actually associated and be proven to be associated with the drug. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Laura, do you want to address these questions? I will try to answer the first one and just maybe you can help me if I don't uh, answer it fully. So with regards to the reports that have occurred in the UK, prior to Brexit they will appear grouped in the database as EEA reports and then we've implemented a something in the system which now they will from January 2021, no, 2021, yes, they will appear as non-EEA reports, but uh, they are still being collected as third country reports. Okay, thank you. Jos, can you answer the second second part of the question? Yeah, I, I maybe also a little bit to expand on the first one. So, uh, if, from the point of view of the veterinarian, we uh, working in the, in, in the UK, for example, the, um, the responsibility of the EU companies is to still collect all the information. So anything that is happening in the UK, they also are obliged to connect to to collect and gets into our databases. So that the information is uh, same as before, if you like, except for the purely nationally authorized products that are in the market in UK only and not in Northern Ireland, because Northern Ireland is a particular case. So any product that's on the market in Northern Ireland is being treated uh, like any other product from the farm business point of view in the EU. So the reporting requirements are the same there. From the veterinary point of view, not much has, has changed. Whenever you report, you will report to the VMT, VMD, I believe, and this information will eventually uh, get um, through the companies in, in our in our databases. On your second question, that's a very important observation, and that's um, so the legislation requires us to publish everything, but everything means indeed everything prior to assessment. So this is information that uh, not necessarily is uh, our case is not necessarily linked to the to the um, 
to the product. So this is uh, prior to evaluation. And what our intention is in the future is to make that much more transparent. So, uh, and to emphasize really the information that will be published after the evaluation. So what you see currently is purely based on our, um, on our requirement to be very transparent with the public, but you're absolutely right. You can't really much, you can't really read much into it because um, you, you should have, you would have to go to the individual data to understand whether there's causality, yes or no. Thank you. Thank you, Jos. I'm looking for questions for our practitioners. We, we have two leading veterinarians in our panel, so you can ask everything. This is Constance Daan and McDaniel. Yes, hello, Constance uh, McDaniel from the Drug Competent Authority. Um, I'm coming back um, to the presentation from Robert Hertz. Uh, thanks a lot for that and addressing the point and the importance of a reporting app. We have considered this quite a couple of times because we know from the certain survey from FEE already done that an app would be appreciated. So we contacted more than once the, the IT companies and we got the feedback that they are not interested in implementing the feature because vets do not ask for it and it's expensive to just develop this, yeah, this feature and they will not do it because it's not asked for. So maybe this is a kind of loop. Yeah, It's not used because it's not there and that's why it's not asked for. So maybe it would be um, an idea as well for the vets to ask for the feature in the, in this, in the software, but then we have to get it, the information to them to, to ask for it. So, I don't really know how to, to solve this problem because we always get a no from the companies, from the IT companies who will not develop solutions for this. But we have this in mind and we will keep on trying, but we come in from the regulator side and not from the vet side. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Constance. Can I see this as a remark? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. thank you very much. The next question is to... Um, uh, that's maybe, maybe I can give a, a very short no, comment on this. Sorry. Um, my idea would be um, that maybe one, one could have one pilot project which uh, gets public funding. Because if you have one uh, practice management software that allows um, this uh, implementation, then it will have a, will have a benefit um, compared to the others. Um, but of course, this is very expensive uh, to do. So I think without public uh, funding of at least one public project, it's going to be yeah, difficult to, to get the companies to actually implement uh, such a system. Yeah. Rens, can I, Rens, can I add it? Yes, of course, and after you, Toril. I think that it, it should be the program that uh, could be uh, embraced the whole uh, veterinarians working stationary in the clinic with the computers, with the secretary, with an office, and also for those who are working in the field. But you know, veterinarians, especially practitioners who are working in the, in the field, they have usually mobile phone. So application also would be very easy to use and we can use it immediately after we detect some adverse effect or you know, some kind of uh, not normal or of lab use. So I think that application would be very useful for field veterinarians as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. A, a practical solution. That, that's why you're called a practitioner, of course. Thanks for that. Toril. Yes, uh, thank you. I couldn't agree more with the Peter because, uh, you know, um, veterinarians really do want to report. That's my opinion. And I think that's all the practitioners' opinions. They do want to report when they see adverse effects. But uh, the easier, the better. Uh, and um, the, the challenge is that uh, then you need new routines. And the new routines have to kind of slip into the practical things. Uh, so it's uh, easy to report and it won't take long. And it's also secure and safe. So I think an app uh, that you can have on your mobile or in your computer uh, will make it, uh, it better. And also I want to rem have a remark on 
uh, the knowledge is very important that the vets, when they report, see that they make a difference, that it is very important that they um, uh, report and then the feedback will give them that um, impression. So the easier, the be better in a busy day. It won't take too long. It has to be click, 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 click. Uh, so they don't feel, we don't feel it wastes our time. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you very much for this, this, this uh, uh, explanation. And also thank you for the statement, basically feds want to report because of course that, that should be the basis. Thank you. Uh, going back to the list, there's a, a raised hand from uh, Ms. Franca Andrade. Uh, Franca Andrade, can you please take yes. the floor? Yes, that's me. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, Mr. Andrade, okay. thank you. We can hear you. Okay, um, I'm from Portugal. I'm responsible for the pharmacovigilance of a company, and I find it very hard the procedures uh, of all in, in general for the people that is in the pharmacovigilance system and for the, um, the colleagues, the veterinarians that are in the field. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's uh, if you can make the system more friendly to the user, it should be nice because sometimes people do, um, don't, don't make the, the, the reports because of that. That's too much thing to do, too much passwords, too much uh, procedures. Uh, I think they are necessary, but if they, they are more friendly to the user, um, people start using uh, more this, this system. That's a okay. remark that I, I find it hard, especially with the veterinarians that are in the field for many years now. Clear, clear point, Mr. Andrade. I, I think you, you make the point that it's well difficult, uh, difficult and time-consuming to, to report. Uh, not only for industry, but as well also for practitioners. I think this is one of the things we try to, to improve now for in the, as a result of the new legislation. Th th thank you for that important point. Are there other questions? We, we are running into a, cl into a close almost. Uh, a question I, I have myself is uh, uh, how to deal with off-label situations? Maybe a question for Jos. Yeah, I briefly mentioned earlier. So off-label had been a question mark uh, and and a discussion item for many, often with with companies. Now it's quite clearly in the legislation, so uh, it's not a hindrance of reporting. I know for some com for some um, in some member states, it's it is a hindrance because uh, my understanding is that. Uh, for certain use of certain products off-label, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in Germany, for example, veterinarians have to justify. And then that's a, a bit of a hurdle where they say, okay, I can be judged uh, if, I'm, if I'm using this product off-label and I'm reporting on top of it an, uh, an adverse event. So definitely that is not the case just to, be, to make that very, very clear. Um, the requirement is quite clearly for the companies. They will have to provide that that information forward. And uh, definitely from the uh, regulator's point of view, there's never going to be any judgment on uh, on the part of the vet being using this uh, product out of label, just to, just to make that clear. Thank you. Thank you, Jos. And then there's a, a, a last question from Mr. Janssen. Yes, I just... Um... I just wanted to address the, the same thing. <laughs> no problem. Uh, uh, um, because um, yeah, I just mentioned it uh, just now, but I I had not, um, it was not mentioned before, I guess. And what I see, I'm working as a veterinarian in pharmacovigilance for a company. And what I sometimes hear from veterinarians is that they are reluctant to report uh, because, of, because they fear consequences from authorities, especially after uh, off-label use of um, veterinary medicines. So this is something that, that, that occurs that, that we hear and we can try to, um, uh, to convince veterinarians to report anyway, but this is, I think it's probable that this is also, um, uh, this is not exclusively for our company, but possibly also for other companies and other veterinarians in the field that there is some reluctance. And I was wondering what your experience is with, the, with this issue. 
Important question. We, we don't want to go for, to prison for, for uh, honest uh, reporting, of course. Uh, Jost, can you answer these last questions and, and maybe other colleagues want to add? Yeah, just maybe repeating what I've already said, but on top of it, it's also the case that whenever the, the privacy legislation uh, of your private data is very strict, as you know, um, in the EU now, so it's quite clear and we have it in all our guidelines that um, the original report, when it gets to a database, whether it's to the company or whether, whether it's to the authority, that data is not going anywhere on who you are. So the, we don't collect any information normally in our database about the veterinarian because it's not essential to the, the, the case of the, um, of the animal that is experiencing an event. So that's, it's another safeguard, if you like, to give feedback to, to, the, to the vet who's reporting. This is really not about the vet reporting, it's about the, the case itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a reassuring answer to a, to a, an important question. Thank you very much, Josh. If there, I see a last hand from Toril. Yes, I just wanted to comment the last thing, uh, thing that you said because exactly that information is so important to get out to the practitioners because you know there is a lot of people that think uh, that the information go further. So this is really important to get into every single vet that that's how it works thank you okay thank you thank you very much uh and then the close is for um mrs canel or mr canel i don't know last hand raised hello Renz. ah it's Ken Ken Lewis, yeah. Lewis. <laughs> i could have known uh, you should have known. Oh, i just want to re-emphasize that use it good it, it, as a practitioner the time in practice um, you d time is of the essence. You don't have time during the day really in practicing. What happens is you start uh, to make a, um, uh, an adverse reaction. It gets put on the side, so it gets forgotten. And so we're ending up, as uh, Toriel and others have said, with a situation. And it's a chicken and egg situation at the moment. The companies don't want to put on the, the money in the PMS. and do they want the data? The answer is you have. We have to come to a, an arrangement somewhere of to what actually they want, or what the EMS, you know, EMA wants. Does it want the data? If it does, it's going to have to get it in a more um, easier way for the practitioner to submit it. Thank you, Kenel, uh, as as a good re remark, as we as we are used from you. Thank you very much. Well, dear colleagues, uh, this is the moment to uh, to close this uh, this this panel. I'd like to thank all the people who asked questions, and of course, like to to thank the the, the panel, the colleagues who try to address these questions and and, and remarks. And uh, I think for a wrap up, we have to go back to close to for the final close and wrap up. We have to go to Jos again. Yeah, th thank you very much, Hans. Oh, my thanks also to all the, all the participants. I, I've learned that we can have a really good discussion and, and have very uh, interesting input, uh, something that we need to foresee more time and at our next p webinar. Uh, hopefully, we have given you some insight on how we think and, and we're going to run pharmacovigilance under the new legislation. There are definitely a number of bottlenecks that have been highlighted in terms of the recording. And as the last speaker said, the, the key thing will be um, to bring something that is that that makes reporting very easy. Um, an app it has been used on the uh, as an as an experiment on the human side. It was not such a success. Um, but I, I take I have it as a takeaway message that we should consider it. And I also learn that perhaps we need to go and find some public funding for, for an app for, to do the side of the reporting. And then you've heard from us that we have a number of ideas uh, on the side of giving feedback, because that's the other part that clearly we need to improve on. We have a number of uh, proposals there, and we're going to work on that. And hopefully, in one of the next um, webinars, we can give you more insight and, and have further exchange on, on where we are and how we can improve things further. Um, towards um, a good functioning system. So that leaves me to thank you all, the speakers in particular, and uh, people giving input 
for your participation at this first uh, webinar. Um, just to mention, it has been recorded, uh, this webinar, for people who want to uh, send it to some, somebody and it can be revisited afterwards. Um, the sun is still shining here. A good moment to still go outside if that's possible for you. That's what I'm going to do. Thank you very much for the nice afternoon talk and uh, have a good have a good day. Thank you.